Today, I'm honored to have on my little show a true legend of punk rock, Lee Ving, frontman of the band Fear. And he's got some great stories about starting out in the punk rock scene, becoming friends with John Belushi and their performance with Fear that got them banned on SNL. And then he hangs, you know, hanging out with Mick Jagger and John Belushi, pretty crazy stuff there. Uh, he talks about new music coming out and a new documentary on the band Fear as well. So it all starts right now. So yeah, like I said, I, I learned a lot about you. Um, some interesting stuff that I think maybe even some of your hardcore fans don't know. Like, explain the story. You almost went to Yale. Is that right? I, I was in uh, in process for that, and uh, they they had their own program for. Uh, completing that process and getting gaining my entrance to the freshman uh, year at Yale. And uh, at the, at the time it was uh, uh, the uh, Vietnam war was, it was raging. And uh, in, in as much as they wanted, uh, th there was a program they wanted, to, to put in place that wasn't uh, capable of, of uh, I wasn't able to hang around without being matriculated, uh, without getting drafted. Mm. So I uh, enlisted and uh, as, as that process took place for my uh, there there was a, a capability of enlisting i i think i let the draft thing take its course uh because it was shorter and uh so then wound up uh after after my uh after that was over when i was uh, honorably discharged it uh the the idea of that uh, going to Yale had uh, dissipated somewhat in my brain, uh, wanting to do music. And uh, so uh, got my way back to Philadelphia and became lead singer in uh, Sweet State and Chain, a blues band uh, with this guy, Danny Starobin, who mm -hmm. was the guitar player. And uh, we had a good course in Philadelphia playing the electric factory opening for everybody that came through the Chambers Brothers, et cetera. And uh, then moved to New York, joined a band called Daybreak, uh, met my future wife to be. Uh, before there was a Daybreak album, I hightailed it to Los Angeles and uh, began to uh, look around found myself a place in a in a local band as a uh, uh, as the lead singer and started writing and stayed in the uh more of a uh what was common at the time uh for getting into the music business you wind up playing bar gigs and doing whatever you could to keep uh, pizza on the table so to speak and uh so that wound up taking its course for a while. Then all of a sudden, there became this thing called punk rock. And Brendan Mullen moved to town and opened up this burnout basement, called it The Mask, and began to put on shows with uh, local participants and, uh, and some touring. But uh, the, the main roster of... Uh, punk rock bands in Los Angeles was offered a place to play with his basement place in Hollywood. And uh, then the, the whiskey and the starwood started picking this up, you know, figuring that uh, maybe there was some percentage in it for them. And uh, who cares what you call it or uh, what, what its position and posture is as long as it's what's happening and brings in paying customers, they were content. And uh, 
it was during that time I put the band together. It was uh, immediately the, the first version of the band was me, uh, Durf Scratch, and Johnny Backbeat. Those not their given Christian names. <laughs> <laughs> but did, yeah, because didn't you see some of these punk bands happening and you weren't playing punk at the time, but you thought, I can do that and I can do it better than those guys. I can write better songs. I can I can make riots happen better. You could you could be a better yeah, punk rocker. That, that is correct, Omundo. Mundo. Yeah. And uh, being that I that I did have training, I was able to do some more things than some of the other people were able to do. And uh, I, I I enjoyed that. I dug it. It was, uh, you know, that the crowds were getting bigger. We were playing bigger shows. Um, the the headliners at the time I started Fear were like uh, Black Randy and the Metro Squad, and hmm. uh, uh, and other other bands, the Weirdos. The Dead Boys were around too, right? They were at the time, but the Dead Boys were an East Coast band. Oh, okay. And that that format was somewhat different, but uh, the the thing it, it was very street level in, in L.A. And I, I sort of enjoyed that. And then as, uh, as time progressed reasonably quickly, I might add, uh, we started being able to open for touring bands that were more of a national status already that were coming through places like the Whiskey A Go-Go and the Starwood and, uh, and uh, getting to play on, on bills like that. And then we started touring as well on top of it. Uh, Danny Hutton from Three Dog Night was our manager for a while. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. And uh, so, uh, and he was pivotal in, in placing us in a lot of the uh, places re- that we needed to be at the time in order to, to garner the interest of the crowd and the, the audience that was there at the time. And uh, so it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, that was, that was the point from which we started to to get better and better and uh, do better and better on the scene. And then uh, uh, John Belushi, may he rest in peace, became aware of us and uh, was we got in communication. He said he was coming out to the West Coast. And when he did, we got together and hung out for a while. You know, we went around town to the different places and he, God bless him, got us on Saturday Night Live. And uh, that was a major push for us. Yeah. And I don't think people knew a lot of people, if they hadn't been to a punk rock show, they didn't really know what it was like. And they were probably seeing that for the first time on SNL. And probably some people, obviously the president of NBC, one of them horrified, right? I would assume that yes, the old guard, the, the people in positions of power, the people who never had heard of or ever seen anything called punk rock would be uh put off by the whole idea it it wasn't polite and uh uh kiss your butt and uh everything worked out to a t it was more like you know uh go with the moment and uh so we, we we liked that and we got on saturday night live and brought that that ethic if you will (laughs) with us and uh and I, I thought the show went great. And uh, in, in the, 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 the musical guests played two musical sequences. Being that our songs were shorter, we got to play two songs in each sequence. And in the second sequence, uh, something, uh, uh, the, the kids came up on the stage as they were in the habit of doing. Hmm. Saturday Night Live was not used to that. And... Uh, they shut the, they uh, went to stock footage during one of the most rambunctious portions of that second offering from us. And uh, it, it served our purposes perfectly, created the exact feeling that uh, a more authentic punk rock feeling than would have been the case had we just played and uh, politely said, thank you, good night. And uh, thanks to John for getting us on and et cetera, et cetera. And John kind of did that on purpose, right? He kind of yes, wanted it to absolutely. be kind of a, yeah, a he, disaster. He, I, I was not uh, completely aware of what his status was with the Saturday Night Live, uh, 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 with all the Saturday Night Live people. 
and and what how he was getting along with the show at the time. Uh, I think he was very happy to have gotten us on where it was mayhem at the end of what we were doing, not organized, not a uh, polite kissy face. Thank you for having us kind of deal. And and didn't the um, somebody grabbed the mic? I think it was the singer Fugazi grab. Was he the one that said fuck New York or did he just say New York sucks? But somebody said fuck New York and it made it through. He- the yes, Saturday. and the and the brass at Saturday Night Live were horrified. Hit the button for stock footage immediately, but it, it, they couldn't they couldn't have known uh, or realized that they were creating the perfect exit routine for our band to sign off and say good night rather than you know politely say well thank you very much for having us you know blah 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 blah. Uh, it it uh, to have gotten shut down that way with the audience on the stage at Saturday Night Live, excuse me, you know, that's that's not what they were expecting, nor were they happy with that. No. I was. Yeah. I, I thought it was it was perfect. It was, uh, it all fit all the format. Was but, that like uh, a typical show back in those days? I mean, there's a pumpkin flying, there's people yelling on the, at the you, you're yelling back at the audience. Like, yes, that's kind of how the shows were back then. The, the stage manager got hit in the chest with that pumpkin. And it smashed all over. Him. <laughs> and that kind of shit happened at all these shows. Cause like explain to my audience, like what it was like in those late seventies, early eighties punk shows. Like it was chaos, right? It was crazy. It was slam dancing. And, and the audience, yeah, you, I just saw this video and, you know, of you guys we were, arguing. We were haranguing them with the vocals, you know, yeah. rah, 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 rah. And, and the counts were, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. and the band was going, bat, bat. you know, the, 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 to that time, the rock beat was, now the rock beat thanks to us that we chose that i counted off for our drummer johnny backbeat at the time and then spit joined the band shortly after that and philo too so it was me spit philo and durf and that was the band that stayed in place and the band that played saturday night live and so the 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 standard beat for rock and roll was the bap when we took over when we started playing the rock the beat was which was like twice the amount of beats yeah it's a lot faster that you had been used to getting before so you're getting more bang for your buck with fear and i would tell them that you know, you're hearing, we, you get way more notes here, man. You know, you put this in the bank. Yeah. So obviously the music's faster. And what I also really love that I'm just now discovering more of Fear's uh, music is the lyrics. The yeah. lyrics are, so, it's so refreshing even right now because it's so un-PC. But, but it's not that you guys did it because you hated people. You were equal oppor- uh, opportunity offenders is what you, the term that's you used, right? That's what I said. That's how I described this. Yeah. And I, I was proud of that. And I wanted that to be what, you know, we were not a, a kissy face. Here you are, band. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. Thank you for having us. That was not the format whatsoever. But the format was more endearing to the audience. That's not the right word. The, the, the <laughs> format was, was more, it, it drew the audience in. And they became frenzied along with us. I was up on stage. I play guitar and uh, was up on stage either with the guitar on or not and haranguing with my fist in the air. You know, I don't care about you and uh, do me some damage. And, uh, uh, you know, all, all the all the songs that we had done that were uh, to that point that I had written that were designed to cause chaos in the audience and in an in, in, in enjoyable chaos not something that was negative it was it was negative only to the establishment because it, i felt that they needed to be uh woken up and they were they were missing the point because the point was satire yes yeah and the point I mean, was to be entertaining and to be funny yeah and to do it in a different way not thank you very much but uh do me some damage, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's a way of saying uh, 
So what have we got for recreational activities here tonight, so to speak? <laughs> right. <laughs> but so like, do some people get like, get seriously mad? They're like, did you guys have, I mean, there must've been feminists back in the seventies and eighties. I mean, like the songs, like the mouth don't stop and, and stuff like, I mean, do they get pissed off or you just, do they understand? Oh, that's just punk. That's just what they do. Well, that's how the trouble today with women is the mouth don't stop. So <laughs> in some corners, if we're giving women uh, uh, the raspberries, that would be uh, entertaining to them and acceptable. Uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it, we, would, we would play all sides against each other to create the maximum amount of foment that we could possibly do at any, any given time. And so Saturday Night Live somehow fell right into place and uh, and John was just smiling and tickled pink. <laughs> he was just as happy as a bed bug. Uh, maybe the negotiations between he and the Saturday Night Live uh, staff, crew, and management weren't going quite so well at that point. Or you know, I don't I don't know exactly, but uh, he just looked. Lo he looked at. He would look at the camera that night and just raise that one eyebrow and not say anything right like the cat that ate the canary yeah was it so what was he like hanging out off camera was he always funny like off camera too he he was funny too a, a tremendous human being a kind loving intelligent human being that had this uh penchant for humor and uh, uh and also had uh that eyebrow up kind of uh half smile that enjoyed being uh, uh, troublesome in some way, but funny and, you know, to, to a good purpose, not to a bad purpose, mm -hmm. just to, to, to have the entertainment factor come in a, in a different way, which he was extremely good at. Wasn't that one of the first times you hung out with him? Uh, you, you, he brought Mick Jagger over at some bar uh, on the rocks yeah. or something like that. Yes. We were, we were at on the rocks. Mick Jagger was in town there. I am unknown at that time uh, to, uh, to the major people that we eventually became known by. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm with the people in the, our band. I, I'm with John Belushi. And now I'm also with Mick Jagger, who is rock and roll royalty if there ever was. And uh, you would have had trouble finding someone more advanced uh, in in re world renown and uh, in in band history than he and his band, and I was a big fan of theirs as well too. From like years before, mm -hmm. uh, the you know the Rolling Stones were the scruffy rock guys to listen to, and uh, you know had had their own sort of uh, disenfranchisement but it was subtler and you had to be more careful at that time. Um, I, I think you, you couldn't have been as, as raucous and outright saying it in their face as it became popular to do later, a little bit later on, as it became popular to do right around the time me and John Belushi and Mick were in that bar on, on the rocks, enjoying conversation, industry, scuttlebutt. Do you remember any of that conversation? I mean, to be a fly on the wall of that, that would be amazing. Yeah, that would that would have been interesting for anyone at that point to to hear our, our conversation. We we were talking about trying to, you know, ad advance this thing, this punk rock thing, which had not been done by anybody except the Sex Pistols mm. by that time. Yeah. And uh to have even improved upon that and gotten to where the Rolling Stones are, that absolute rock royalty, was something we began to consider. I mean, after all, there we are with John Belushi and on the rocks, hanging out with all these people, these these people I just mentioned, the rock and roll royalty, and uh, and it it did serve its purpose. It, it it did that in addition to our Saturday Night Live performance, put us out there way large. It was it was a huge, wonderful move. Absolutely. Well, and then you did shows with a uh, Black Flag back then, back in the late seventies, early eighties, right? Yes. 
Yeah. So what was it like? Uh, Black I would flag, assume that- the germs, uh, you know, anybody who circle was jerks. The, the weirdos, circle jerks were just just getting ready to start. Keith was in the front row of every performance we played with uh, at least two or three quarts of Budweiser and uh, then would would stand there screaming stuff at us while we're playing. And, you know, that seemed very normal and, and as per for the time. And then he put the circle jerks together and it began to make more sense. And so circle jerks, black flag, um, you know, all the ones I've mentioned so far, the weirdos. Uh, it, uh, were were the bands that were playing, and that there were there were more bands coming at, at that time. Yeah, and then and then later you played with the uh, you were actually on the Vans Warp tour with like those newer. Uh, what, what would you call that? I mean, because I don't know if I'd call that punk. It's like pop punk music. What did you think of that movement when punk kind of came back, but it was more poppy? Well, at that point, any stage would have done. You know, <laughs> I, I don't care what they called it. We come out there and do what we do. And that brings in the crowd who's among the crowd who are not aware of the punk rock thing and blends that and, and brings them even the more pop oriented people that that was the reason they got to the show originally. They wound up enjoying the show because of the punk rock stuff, which they had never heard before. It was refreshing to them like what like it is and was for everyone else. Yeah. Did, did a lot of those bands, were they fans of you? Like, I would think that you've influenced a lot of those, even if they're playing more pop punk, a lot of those uh, bands were big fans of the real punk too. Yes. And, and we would say shit that was insulting to, to them uh, as a joke <laughs> from the stage, you know, and, uh, and I'm, then I would say, nah, only kidding, man, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, what about like bad religion? I, I feel like th- that's like a pretty good, they're not really pop punk, but they're they're not uh, obviously the early scene punk either. They like you hardcore. played with them, they were not hardcore. That was the they were not exactly part of the boys club. No, uh, from my viewpoint, uh, yeah, uh, at the at the outset, but they did well enough. I think they advanced and became popular, and you know had their own audience. Yeah, well, and the singer Greg, I mean, he's a really smart guy too. He's a like a PhD from Cornell, right. Do you ever have conversations with him? I I don't recall you know, having any in-depth conversations with him. No, I don't. Hmm. Well, and then also I want to ask you about the, the acting. That's also a big part of your career too. And uh, it's crazy that you got an agent from William Morris agency. That's like, isn't that one of the biggest agencies in Hollywood? I feel like it's still huge today. And, and at one point or at the outset, one of the only ones, that was handling the big deal stuff. And so it was, uh, it was great. And I'm sure that the stuff that we were able to be in on Saturday Night Live and all this other, uh, while not being directly related to, to uh, film acting was helpful. And uh, the producers would would not have overlooked the fact that I was able to play Saturday Night Live and that we were popular. And uh, at the end of the day, anything that brings in more moviegoers to paid viewings of the film is good. Right. So you feel like it maybe helped you get roles being the singer of fear rather than hurt you? Yes. It was like a, a, a backwards philosophy that was working. And yeah. uh, so if you didn't understand how I put that together, so much the better that, gotcha. that, would, that would leave you uh, having coffee in some place some burnout coffee shop in hollywood while i'm talking to big time producers wow yeah so one of the movies that you did get crazy do you remember that one it was in 83 and it had uh because it had yes. other musicians Alan directed yeah it had the uh, john densmore from the doors and uh lou reed from velvet yes. underground and Malcolm McDowell. That's a pretty good cast. Yes. Uh, and Malcolm, it was uh, totally cool to hang out with and uh, a, a great fellow. That's what I hear. He's a really good storyteller. Yes. It was uh, very enjoyable. And that movie was pivotal. Yeah. And, uh, but, and then also <laughs> there was Flashdance and Streets of Fire. And uh, speaking of being pivotal, 
Yeah. Was the flash dance one? Tell the explain the story. Like Jennifer Beals was was scared of you or something, or what was the story there? Uh it was her first film, but it was made the the, the movie that we did with Penelope Spheris about punk rock was pretty much my first film. Mm-hmm. Unless I've forgotten a couple where I was uh, just a passing person in something or or or, or the like, but. Uh, Yes, it was her first film and she didn't know what to expect. And I think I could see that trepidation in her and I played on it. It was uh, it was sort of fun. <laughs> <laughs> She's a nice lady, you know, yeah. and, and the film was uh, well accepted and uh, successful. But uh, I couldn't help but see the opportunity for some punk rock conjecture at uh, at the different points during the day and i think she took it as as sort of an attack but it wasn't that was not my purpose it was just to try to uh, identify the uh the the different places in the world that a person could come from that the, disparate as it may have been we were putting ourselves together for the purpose of this film and that was working so uh to have her be on edge a bit i found humor in and uh i confess to having uh, played upon that a bit yeah well it's like character acting is that i think that's what they call it yes. right yeah. yeah and the day is long film days are long you know 16 hours or 12 hours some days or something and so to entertain yourself is a good thing to do rather than you know just uh becoming uncomfortable or something like that i was ecstatic to be on a movie set and i didn't care how or why or what or who and was uh vowed and determined to uh make my days as profitable uh and as big an investment in doing more of this as I could possibly do when mm-hmm. I, and I felt that was the smart way to look at it. I still think it is. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you had clue and a movie with Tommy Lee Jones. And then what about this yes. one? Yeah. yeah what- Tommy Lee's a great actor, man. And that was, that was, that was great doing that film. We, Black, Moon and Rising. Along, Black Moon Rising. He and yeah. I got along great. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, I, I only heard the only story I know about Tommy Lee Jones was like when he did Batman forever and he, he wasn't a fan of Jim Carrey or something like that, but he was a fan of you. Uh, uh, I think we had raspy attitudes in common. Oh, you know, that there was, uh, he, he understood, uh, to say, uh, he, uh, capiche you know, what that is and the enjoyment that can be gotten from that, especially as others don't understand it. (laughs) It's like a sense of humor thing. Yeah. Yes. They don't understand it, but they realize they're being had or gotten (laughs) to sort of, but they're not exactly sure how, and that further pisses them off. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. All to the good in, in, in my view at that point. Right. And then do you remember this one that you did Fast Sofa in 2001? Because I, I, you worked with, or I don't know if you had any direct contact with him, but Crispin Glover, he's such an interesting guy. Is he a fan of you and your band or your, is your band too mainstream? Because he's, he's kind of an interesting guy. I, I, I recall the film. Uh, I, I think we got along well. And the, uh, the, the both strange places that we had each come from sort of, uh, added to our uh our camaraderie in, okay. invited that some some more and and uh yeah that, that that was very cool too that's fun yeah you have some so many cool things are do you have any uh upcoming acting roles or anything like that any movies coming out uh not that i've signed on the bottom line to yet but i i'm always talking to somebody or another about some something having to do with that, and I'm still very interested in it. Mm-hmm. You know, as as you get older and all that stuff, uh, you can move through the different parts that are uh, that that come up in things that uh, play right into your pocket. Right. And, uh, I'd like to to keep it on on that level as as we go here, and uh, 
while I'm still singing these uh, beautiful melodic love songs to people from the stage. Uh, the the uh, big time producers are always welcome to uh, submit any, any things that they have in mind that might work out. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so tell me about, you have a new album it's coming out or it's not out yet, but it's, is it, is it a, did I hear it was a double album or triple album or something? Yes. There's a three, is it a triple album coming out. Uh, so uh, the, the rights to the fear, fear record, fear the record. Um, <laughs> that That's funny. It's the fear record, but it's also fear the record. <laughs> have uh, reverted to us from Warner Brothers. We, ah. we have received that back into the family fold. It is now owned by us. Oh, nice. Uh, uh, we are reissuing uh, Fear the Record with a three LP, three CD box set pre-orders on May 16th, which would be the 40th anniversary of the original release. Box sets will be shipped in December. Oh, nice. That's and, good. Yeah. Cause like the, 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 you guys, is that the one you re-recorded because you didn't have the rights to it? No. Oh, this, this is the original record. Right. But record. isn't that the one you had is one of them like on Spotify, I think was like a re-record. Am I crazy? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly, okay. uh, but this is the doing. original. So that's the good yeah. thing. Yeah. This, this is, the, this is the one. Then there's, uh, we're in production. Uh, I, I'm reading this from from Robert. He, he okay. made me a list of some things I wanted to uh, to tell you today. Oh yeah. We're in production on a new album with Slash, Duff, and Shooter Jennings guesting. Will be a double album with 27 songs, many of which were have never been heard, had not been released, but have been in the can for years. Uh, mm -hmm. We're in the studio next week. Uh, doing stuff with Shooter and uh, and with this new project, and we're in production of a feature length documentary about Fear, and the director uh, is named Jason Zink. Yes. Okay. So lots of good stuff to look forward to. Awesome. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I will put that in the notes and then with your website, um, so people can click on that and then follow you. Are you on social media? I'm assuming you or the band is right somewhere, Facebook or something. Y yes. Yeah, I, I believe we are. Okay, so I'll put that in there. And then um, is there any charities that you've worked with or that you want to promote here at the end? I always end each episode with a, a charity of the guest choice. Yes. And uh, which it, 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 that's, that's very important. And which exact ones they are there, there may be a half a dozen, but I would dearly love to discuss them with you and if there is uh, some charity contribution that's uh, being made by people that you have interviewed uh, I'd like to discuss that with you too yeah I just I just like to promote you know you know raise awareness for something if there's a cause that's near and dear to your heart now let's put the I can put the website in the show notes so if anybody has extra money after of course they buy your box set if they have a few leftover dollars they can contribute it to a you know a cause that is near and dear to your heart Yes. I, and I see one that's on TV being advertised now, something uh, that's a, a new uh, charity cause. Uh, but uh, I'll have to check it out again uh, in order to mention it to you correctly. OK, yeah, just so uh, you can have uh, Robert email it to me or whatever. That's fine. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, uh, thanks so much, Lee. Well done for you, man. Good for you for taking an opportunity to do something like that. When, yeah. Uh, you know, many, many just ignore that. Yeah, there's, no, it's there's, it's there's needy folks in the world. And absolutely. Anything, anything you can do to help them is a good thing. Yeah. And it's interesting, like that song, I don't care about you. It, you're not saying like, I don't care. It's more like a commentary that's, that people yes. don't give a shit about these other people, which I thought was really cool. When I heard that, I was like, oh, that's so different than what I thought that song was about. Yes. It's not, it's not just blatantly complaining about my fellow human beings. It's, it's about my fellow beings being more caring with language that's never been used to promote a message like that. And uh, some, somehow it, uh, it gets through. Yeah. Somehow people see it, that what, what exactly it was 
I was trying to do by saying something brash and uh, uh, unfriendly <laughs> as that. Right. When the, well, the purpose was altogether different. Yeah. Well, I think that's like part of uh, rebelling against the uh, the system and punk rock is, uh, is uh, yeah, Put not treating people like shit. Don't understand and laugh at them for not understanding it. Exactly. Gets you, gets you to the to home plate in a, a big time way. When, Absolutely. Uh, in some cases, that's deserved. Not all. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you, do, you have to be careful and uh, make, make sure you're you're promoting progress. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Lee. Uh, you're a legend. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. This is amazing. Yes, sir. And let's stay in touch. Okay. When, Sounds good. When we, when we sign off here, let's, uh, let's give each other a phone call every now and again and uh, stuff like that. See okay. Kind of That'd be amazing. Being, yeah. Thank you. This being, this being my pleasure. And thank you for having me. Okay. Bye-bye, Lee. All, all the best to you. Man. Bye. Thank you to Lee for taking the time to come on my show and to Robert for helping set this up. Uh, it's always fun to talk to someone of that stature. I think he was massively influential to a lot of musicians and these punk rockers in the late 70s and 80s. They really created a whole new genre of music, which hasn't been done in a very long time. So Lee is very talented as an actor, and he not only plays punk music, but he also did a jazz record. So we'll have to talk about that next time. In the meantime... Make sure to follow Lee on social media for updates on the new music and the new documentary. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. And uh, while you're on social media, uh, please give me a follow as well. I would love to see that. And please make sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you watch or listen to make sure that you'll get immediate updates on when I release a new episode, which lately is quite often. So I've got a few completed that I need to get out and then I'll be scheduling for future ones. So who do you want to see on the show? Uh, now that I'm discovering more punk music, uh, that opens up a lot more possibilities. Uh, but I'm open not only to punk music or rock music, but other kinds of uh, music or film and TV people, athletes, authors, basically anyone who has an interesting story to tell and at least some kind of fan base. That always helps too. So hopefully we'll have some really great guests coming up here. So thank you so much for watching or listening. Have a great rest of your day and remember to shoot for the moon. <laughs>